Good morning and good afternoon from Brussels. Uh, this is Ian Lesser from GMF here in Brussels, and it's really a great pleasure to welcome you all here today for our conversation uh, with European Commission Executive Vice President Valdis Dombrovskis on a renewed transatlantic agenda. And we're really delighted to be able to have this a conversation with him today. Uh, Executive Vice President, thank you very much for taking time from a very busy schedule, I'm sure, uh, to be with us. Um, for those of you who know us, you'll know that GMF's mission is really very simple. It's to strengthen transatlantic cooperation. Uh, there are, this has been an interesting number of years for those who are in the transatlantic relations business. And I think, you know, we'll all agree that we now have a lot of very uh, prominent new opportunities to renew the transatlantic relationship in key sectors. Uh, the economic sector, the trade sector, these are obviously key, but could also be some of the most challenging. And we'll get a chance to talk about that uh, today. Um, you have the, the bio, and of course in Europe, uh, the executive vice president is, uh, is more or less a household figure, but just for our American audience and to, to restate briefly, um, the executive vice president is, um, responsible for an economy that works for people. And since October uh, of this year, he's been um, uh, the uh, last year, actually, he serves as the uh, also as the trade commissioner for the European Commission. So critical positions uh, at a critical time. Uh, among other things, uh, as you may know, the um, vice president has also served in his previous incarnation uh, three terms as prime minister of Latvia. Uh, so on many fronts, for many reasons, we're delighted to have you with us here today. Um, let me say also that we're delighted to have as moderator today, uh, my colleague from Washington, uh, GMF visiting senior fellow, Elena Bryan, uh, who specializes in trade policy uh, for us. So Elena, now I'm gonna turn it over uh, to you, but before I do that, I'm just gonna remind our audience that um, the link to this uh, conversation will be available on GMF's YouTube channel uh, to watch afterwards. So without further ado, Elena, over to you. And thank you all very much for joining us again. Thank you, Ian, um, and good morning, uh, good afternoon, good late afternoon. Um, before I turn to the executive vice president, let me just say that we're gonna use the Q&A function for this discussion. If you have questions you'd like to pose, please um, put them into the Q&A function. Um, the executive vice president will speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll start the Q&A. Mr. Dombrovskis. Uh, thank you, uh, Elena, uh, Honorable uh, Vice President uh, Lesser. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for your uh, uh, introduction and uh, let me also thank uh, German, uh, German Marshall Fund for uh, taking this initiative. So I'm uh, grateful for this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, it is uh, imperative that we make the 2021 a landmark year for closer transatlantic relations. The German Marshall Fund has always been a strong advocate in this respect. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I grew up in Latvia during the time when it was occupied by the Soviet Union. Uh, like many people of my uh, generation, this has uh, colored my viewpoint of life and politics. Uh, my generation saw the contrast between the two global uh, powers of the era. The USSR was an authoritarian regime while the European community and United States were strong global defenders of freedom, democracy, market-based economy, and international institutions. Uh, for us, uh, behind the Iron Curtain, uh, being part of the uh, free world seemed like an impossible dream. Uh, we have not forgotten how uh, the transatlantic alliance and the US supported the Baltic states in our way towards freedom. Uh, today, Latvia and its Baltic neighbors have found our place in the international order as established and active members of the European Union and NATO. Uh, but we do not forget that democrat uh, democratic values and institutions uh, cannot be taken for granted. Uh, just look at the situation at our neighborhood uh, in the East, uh, uh, the march for democratic ideals despite severe restrictions on their individual uh, freedoms, and they hope to be heard. 
Uh, I believe that shared values lead to strongest possible alliances. So by reaffirming our shared values, like the defense of democratic ideals, we can revive the transatlantic bond. Over the last four years, uh, this bond has been weakened. Uh, but with the new administration in Washington, the European Union is helpful that the door is opening for a new chapter in transatlantic relations. Uh, these uh, relations, to quote uh, Jean Monnet, will be built through concrete achievements, creating a de facto solidarity. Today, I would like to outline three areas where I believe there is real potential to build these concrete achievements. First, working together for an inclusive recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. Second, forging a coalition of like-minded countries to recast a global trade rulebook. And third, joining forces to address the climate challenge. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the EU and US should act to ensure that post-pandemic recovery supports our workers, protects their incomes, and creates new opportunities for them to become active participants in tomorrow's economy. Uh, the recovery must be global, inclusive, and sustainable. Uh, but uh, first, we should work together to end the global health crisis. Only when we succeed there can the global economy fully rebound. Uh, initial economic policy responses have been bold and quick in both the US and EU. Uh, we need to extend support measures for as long as it's needed to protect people and companies. Uh, a coordinated approach will, to be, uh, will be to the benefit of all. At the same time, our economies are undergoing massive changes the, to make them climate neutral and digital. Uh, we need to undertake reforms and investments to help this transition. Uh, in Europe, our next generation EU recovery program combined with a reinforced seven years budget, gives us a package with financial firepower of 1.82 trillion euros. Uh, we see many similarities with President Biden's Build Back Better Economic Plan. Our thinking is uh, aligning on policy choices that help to green the economy, invest in infrastructure, and make it more sustainable. We will also work on social justice and fighting inequalities. Strong education system and effort to reskill workers uh, will be crucial to mitigate the impacts of the coronavirus recession. Uh, President Biden said, uh, a job is about a lot more than a paycheck. It is about dignity. We will have to make sure that uh, going forward, there are new and better jobs created on the both uh, sides of the Atlantic. We also need to answer the call of our citizens for fairness in international taxation. Uh, reaching a global consensus-based solution on the taxation of the digital economy will be crucial in this respect. Uh, trade has a fundamental role to play in our recoveries. Uh, our economies are very interdependent. The EU and US are each other's largest trade and investment partner, with trade in goods and services worth over 1 trillion euros annually. The EU is the largest supply source for EU, uh, US businesses, but also the largest export uh, market to sell American goods and services. In return, the EU exports almost twice as much to the US as we do to China. Our re relationship supports tens of millions of jobs uh, on both uh, sides. Uh, we can build on this strong foundation. This is uh, precisely why we need to put our current trade disputes behind us. Uh, this is a vital first step to create the space we need. It will help to restore confidence and trust. It will instantly help our economies. My uh, second message today is that the US and EU should join forces uh, to lead a strong coalition of like-minded countries to define the standards and policies of 21st century trade. Uh, this must be done in a way that reflects our joint values. Uh, trade policy needs to benefit all firms, workers, consumers, and citizens at large. It must not benefit only the few. Uh, let me give one example. Uh, in the data-driven economy and with fast emerging technologies in particular, 
modern regulations need to meet increased societal demands for transparency and openness. Uh, we share a broad uh, worldview that human ethics should prevail over algorithms. The digital transformation offers an opportunity to form an alliance of democracies in the digital realm. We therefore propose to establish a high level trade and technology council. This will give us a forum to uh, close the transatlantic gap on digital and technological standards, rules, measures, and policies, and to shape it globally in a manner that is true to our shared values of open and democratic societies. Uh, another work strand for such a coalition would be working together to fight forced labor and child labor across the globe. We know that the US is already working intensively on these issues. My third proposal is for the EU and US to lead the way on climate action. We warmly welcome the decision of the Biden administration to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, of course, many prominent Americans continue to carry the climate flag over the past four years. Uh, I had the pleasure to work hand in hand with Michael Bloomberg on a sustainable finance initiative designed to incentivize the flow of private capital to planet friendly projects. Uh, as you know, the EU is set to achieve the climate neutrality by 2050. A similar commitment by the US would make about two thirds of the global economy greener. It would cut more than half of the world's emissions. Such global leadership would encourage others to follow. For this, we should align our policies on green, circular, competitive and inclusive economies. Uh, getting there will require investment, innovation and the rise, uh, right price signals. So we should work together on emission trading, carbon price, pricing, and taxation. Uh, as we have both expressed a willingness to tackle carbon leakage, the EU notably plans to propose a carbon border adjustment mechanism in full respect of these WTO rules. A wider transatlantic green trade agenda could include trade and climate initiative within the WTO. Uh, making it easier to trade climate-friendly goods and services could give renewed relevance to the organization. Uh, we can also work in the WTO to make fisheries more sustainable, to reduce the scourge of plastic pollution, and to allow trade to become a catalyst for innovation, including in the circular economy. Uh, another area where we could work together is the area of green finance. The EU has good experience from uh, designing its taxonomy or green classification system of economic activities that contribute to mitigating or aver averting climate change. Uh, this is the first on, of its kind in the world. Uh, as major financial hubs and regulators, the EU and US are best placed to set the standards and to generate the vast amounts of private investment needed to transform economies. I accordingly invite the US to join the International Platform on Sustainable Finance. Ladies and gentlemen, for these three ideas to move forward, there is an additional step we need to take. We urgently need an updated multilateral rulebook and functioning structures at the World Trade Organization. Uh, in a few weeks' time, I will table a detailed EU agenda for WTO reform. Uh, 25 years after its birth, the WTO, uh, WTO needs a fresh look and a fresh start. Uh, it needs new ways to, uh, to working together and to reflect the world we live in today. Uh, our reform ideas are pitched to the membership of the WTO as a whole, but also as a genuine offer to the US to join us in updating an organization that we did so much to build. Uh, agreeing on the selection of the WTO Director General would be a first important step before we move on to the bigger reform agenda. We could then develop up-to-date rules and disciplines to tackle new economic balances in the global trading system, including those caused by state-led economic models. Uh, we can work together to make trade greener and fairer. We can look on how to reform dispute settlement system to serve a membership in positively resolving trade disputes. Of course, WTO reform is also an essential strand in our approach to dealing with China. The EU and US have many converging interests in this respect, 
and it is in our strong mutual interest to work together. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the EU wants to turn a new page with the United States. Uh, at this moment in history, when the world has been shaken by the pandemic and major geopolitical shifts, uh, it is uh, imperative that we get back to working together. The EU has already reached out to Biden an adaptation with our December communication for the new transatlantic agenda, and we are keeping lines of communication to Washington open. Uh, it is no exaggeration to say that the world is depending on us and for our future place in the world, we depend on each other. Uh, in my view, any challenge we face uh, will benefit from transatlantic leadership and any solution proposal will be str stronger with our joint effort. In conclusion, Europe is reaching out to the United States with a clear message. We want to build back better together. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your remarks, um, which come at, a, I think, an interesting time in the United States. We're at the first, second full week of the Biden administration. Um, there's been a lot of activity in the last 10 days, um, much of it uh, domestic focused. As, uh, as Mr. Biden campaigned on, but also with um, members of his administration, particularly the cabinet officials reaching out to our foreign partners, including in the EU. Um, the administration has said that, that reinvigorating the transatlantic alliance is, um, is an important thing. Um, and I appreciate your comments on what you see uh, could be part of a reinvigorated transatlantic um, alliance. Um, we have a number of questions um, from our participants, and um, let me let me start with one um, from Brandon Timpain. He says there is clearly a base level of tension and mistrust between the U EU and UK after Brexit. And I would add, I think there's some level of tension between the US and EU. There is always some level of tension between the US and EU, but there's been more in the last few years. Um, how do you see the relationship between the US and the EU and the EU and the UK affecting transatlantic relationships? Does it, does it create an awkwardness or rivalry between Brussels and London vis-a-vis -vis us, do you think? Uh, okay, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for this uh, question. Uh, I think first we need to look uh, uh, at this question uh, a bit more uh, broadly. And if we take this broader look, we uh, are uh, seeing that uh, EU and US are uh, strategic partners. We share common values. We share common approaches on a number of uh, policy issues. So it's important that we work uh, together. And the same is true for uh, EU-UK or US-UK uh, relations. We are all part of the Western democratic world. We uh, share the broad outlook and therefore we must work together internationally. And I think if we work together, we can be a globally force uh, for the good. So on, uh, more specifically on EU-US uh, relations, uh, indeed, uh, there had been uh, some tensions, notably in the area of uh, trade, and that's why I addressed them also in my uh, speech, outlining uh, elements uh, which we need to resolve uh, currently uh, in bilateral trade disputes, like uh, question on steel and aluminum tariffs, which were imposed on the EU and corresponding EU regulatory tariffs, uh, resolving uh, Airbus Boeing dispute to give most uh, obvious uh, examples. So uh, I think it's very important that we put those uh, bilateral trade irritants behind us and really concentrate on broader international trade uh, agenda on uh, promoting multilateralism and reforming the 
uh, WTO on addressing challenges stemming from the social economic model of uh, China to give some examples. Uh, as regards uh, EU-UK uh, relations, uh, fundamentally, as I said, uh, uh, it's the same. We uh, share uh, values, uh, we share approaches, we are uh, uh, democracies, so we have to work uh, together. We have been saying from the very beginning that we regret uh, Brexit taking uh, place, but that was a decision uh, taken by majority in a referendum, so we respect it. Uh, well, uh, the fact is that uh, recently UK has left both uh, EU single market and customs union. Uh, that requires some, uh, so to say, uh, friction in the movements of uh, goods and uh, services, as it now implies uh, custom controls. Well, that comes by the design of uh, Brexit and by the design of decision of UK to leave single market and uh, customs union. Uh, so uh, this is something which now needs to be uh, factored in. Uh, there are also, in a sense, some um, uh, teasing problems in capacity building, in uh, uh, streamlining all the procedures. So it will take a bit of a time until uh, all the procedures are uh, streamlined to have uh, more uh, seamless movements of goods uh, across uh, our uh, borders. Uh, but we are uh, currently working on this. But fundamentally, as uh, 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 countries, regions sharing the same uh, approaches, sharing the same values, we will have to work together also in the future. Thank you. Um, so last year, the, the commission announced a new policy of strategic autonomy. Um, can, can you explain that to the audience and how, how that will, how you see that working, particularly with the transatlantic relationship? Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, this is a, a concept which we are uh, currently uh, outlining. I would emphasize open strategic autonomy. So uh, basically uh, our uh, message here is that we uh, remain uh, open uh, to the world, we remain uh, committed to the multilateral rules-based system, we remain uh, committed to free and fair trade, so we uh, uh, remain uh, uh, open to uh, this, uh, all aspects of international uh, cooperation. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are becoming more assertive in uh, defending our uh, own uh, interests and rights, interests and rights of European uh, companies, uh, becoming more systemic in trade, defense and uh, enforcement. So in a sense, addressing uh, uh, issues uh, uh, coming from the fact that third countries are not uh, playing uh, by the uh, rules. So that's the basis of our uh, approach. So uh, we remain open, but we become more assertive in uh, defending our interests and rights. Thank you. Um, let me follow up on that point a little bit. We have a question from Dan Price, which is a little bit provocative, but I'm going to read it to you. So the, the, the EU has uh, taken a number of steps recently that, that may not provide a good basis for cooperating with the new Biden administration. And, and the list that I was given is a quest to de-dollarize the EU economy, threatening to block US acquisitions on national security grounds if they subject EU companies to application of US sanctions, onshoring of asset management businesses, labeling US LNG as a brown while promoting importation of Russian gas, signing off on an agreement with China that is chiefly a propaganda victory for Beijing, provocative, giving Russia a pass on Navalny, and giving China a pass on Uyghur genocide and Hong Kong political oppression. And finally, seeking unilaterally to regulate global tech companies in the pursuit of digital sovereignty. Um, how do those fit under open strategic economy and how do you think that those um, 
paved the way for cooperation with a new administration as opposed to the last administration. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, many uh, questions. So let me uh, go uh, through this uh, whole list of points uh, which had been uh, raised. Uh, indeed, uh, recently we uh, published uh, a, a communication on uh, strengthening EU's economic and financial uh, openness and uh, resilience. And uh, among other things, uh, we are working there on uh, strengthening the international role of the euro. And I would say that is not to be uh, confused uh, uh, by the question of de-dollarization. Uh, but I think there is nothing wrong if US is promoting the role of US dollar. And I assume there is nothing uh, wrong if Europe is promoting the role of uh, uh, euro. So indeed, we are looking at Euro is currently the second uh, uh, largest uh, currency in the world, second most used currency in the world for transactions as a reserve currency. Uh, so we are looking how we can further uh, uh, develop Euro's role uh, uh, in uh, international, in international uh, trade as a reserve currency and with our uh, new European economic recovery, which is going to be financed uh, uh, by uh, common EU borrowing. It will provide also a large pool of euro dominated assets, which we think will help with euro's role as uh, reserve uh, currency, uh, how we develop, for example, pan-European instant payment system, how we promote cross-border uh, to, towards the third countries EU payments uh, in a context of uh, uh, global corresponding banking system facing major uh, challenges. I think those are all uh, valid uh, questions which we need uh, to be uh, addressed. Well, on uh, sanctions, uh, indeed, one of the uh, elements in our communication was also uh, uh, strengthening the resilience of EU uh, companies vis-a-vis extraterritorial effects of uh, third country sanctions. Uh, because in EU, we do, do not recognize the legality of the extraterritoriality of third country sanctions. And already for many years, we have what we call, ha, call blocking statute in place to uh, address uh, uh, situations like uh, uh, this. But in general, uh, we uh, support and we have been uh, in many discussions and we uh, hope that we'll have closer cooperation with Biden administration on this. Uh, cooper uh, uh, cooperating uh, and coordinated approach on uh, global uh, sanctions. Uh, then uh, on uh, uh, questions on uh, asset uh, uh, management, well, uh, once again, uh, uh, I think talks about onshoring of asset management uh, is uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, exaggerated. There are ways how uh, uh, the uh, uh, asset management companies can uh, seek access uh, to uh, EU uh, market. Well, uh, as regards um, uh, uh, LNG uh, supplies versus uh, gas uh, supplies uh, from uh, Russia, well, uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, worth uh, noting that uh, we are still in a process of developing uh, uh, the taxonomy. Uh, or classification system of green uh, financial activities. And we are looking at the question of natural gas. And there are certain benchmarks uh, set uh, for uh, this. And this is regardless whether it's, uh, so to say, regardless of the source of natural gas, whether it's shipped from uh, third uh, countries uh, as uh, LNG or uh, comes via uh, pipelines. Uh, but it's uh, true that we are currently assessing the natural gas as a transition activity. Uh, because uh, if we go, go towards carbon neutrality, uh, we will need to phase out fossil fuels, including natural gas. But we acknowledge that natural gas will have some role to play in transition period, uh, especially in countries and regions currently heavily dependent on coal, because the fastest and the cheapest transition which can be done from coal is to natural gas, uh, which uh, uh, otherwise may uh, take uh, more time and more uh, difficulty. But at the same time, we are looking at this issue or not to create in this way stranded assets, because 
in the long term, we uh, are considering with our move towards carbon neutrality actually phasing out of fossil uh, fuels. Uh, question on um, mm, uh, comprehensive agreement on investment with uh, China. Uh, indeed, we reached an agreement uh, in uh, principle uh, in December last year. Uh, and uh, uh, the point is that uh, economic relations between EU and China are characterized by um, uh, asymmetry. So EU's market is much more open to Chinese uh, companies and investment than China's market is to the EU. So uh, we need to address this asymmetry and uh, elements which we have in a comprehensive agreement on investment concerns exactly the questions of level playing field, uh, market access, also questions related to sustainable development. And uh, for example, in the area of sustainable development, uh, climate change, uh, international labor organization fundamental conventions, uh, what uh, we have is a level of commitment of China on par with uh, what is normally in our free trade agreements. But the point is that this is not a free trade agreement, it's something uh, much more narrow. And second, it's the first time China engages in these kind of commitments with also monitoring and uh, uh, enforcement mechanisms with a third uh, country or with a, uh, 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 with a international partner. So we think it's uh, important uh, development. Uh, then we have certain catch up in a sense to do in the EU because in US there is already phase one deal with China addressing a number of the issues we are addressing. Recently, there has been a concluded regional comprehensive economic partnership in Asia. So of course, as the EU, we cannot stay also as a only major uh, economy without any kind of uh, deal of this kind with uh, China. At the same time, I think it's clear that uh, this deal is not addressing all our uh, problems with uh, China, and there are many, and we will need to cooperate very closely, and we are willing to cooperate very closely with US to jointly address those uh, uh, challenges. Uh, then uh, on uh, uh, human rights uh, sanctions. Well, on human rights sanctions, actually, EU has recently developed human rights sanctions mechanism well, it's sometimes uh, called uh, EU's uh, Magnitsky Act uh, to uh, deal with exact, uh, 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 exactly the kind of human rights uh, violations you uh, mentioned. And we are currently working also on another instrument, which is compulsory due diligence instrument, uh, which would uh, compel EU uh, companies to verify their supply chains to ensure that uh, uh, for example, goods are not derived that are stemming from forced labor or from other uh, human rights or environmental uh, violations. And uh, finally, on uh, tech uh, uh, companies, uh, well, if you uh, look at the um, uh, developments both in EU and uh, US, I think there are some uh, concerns which need to be uh, addressed. I already mentioned uh, uh, taxation. The fact is that uh, digital companies are paying effective corporate tax rate, uh, which is uh, roughly one third of uh, what uh, classical companies are paying. And with become economy uh, becoming more and more digital, it becomes bigger and bigger issue for countries' uh, tax revenues. So uh, something we need to address, and uh, we seek to address it uh, through the OECD work stream to agree on a global approach on uh, digital uh, taxation. And we hope that we'll be able uh, to achieve this. Uh, and uh, another uh, question is, of course, of the uh, market uh, power and, so to say, uh, all oligopolic situation of uh, technology uh, giants, where I would say there are number of concerns, both uh, in uh, EU and uh, US. In EU, you also know that they are particularly uh, sensitive, for example, about uh, privacy issues. And uh, uh, there are certain issues uh, we correspondingly need to address. Thank you. Um, can we follow up on, on China? We have a, a variety of questions on 
China generally, but also um, on the on the CAI. Um, so the, I guess one question that came, which I found kind of interesting, is how much patience should there be um, in reforming global trade rules? So if 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 after some period of time the U.S. EU uh, the the U.S., the EU, and other like-minded partners have not been able to convince China to move on issues like industrial subsidies and other things. Um, what are what are the repercussions? And I connect this also in a small way to your China agreement, where there are some labor commitments, the ILO standards that that China has agreed to take on. And what are the repercussions if if China doesn't take those on? So, what do you see? if the international community is not able to have China move on some of these key international trade rules, what, what do you see as the, as the alternatives and how do you think China will um, play in the US-EU relationship? Uh, okay, uh, uh, very good. So on uh, uh, on China EU uh, China relations US China relations, uh, how we uh, cooperate on uh, this? Uh, well, uh, first, uh, indeed. So we have this issue of uh, uh, economic asymmetry. We have issue of uh, disciplines of state-owned enterprises on forced technology transfers on intellectual property rights. Uh, uh, where we uh, broadly uh, share the same uh, concerns. And uh, to the extent uh, we are addressing those uh, concerns in uh, bilateral deals, would it be uh, uh, US-China phase one deal? Would it be uh, EU-China comprehensive agreement on uh, investment? But uh, obviously it will not solve all our challenges. So we uh, also need to have WTO reform to address uh, uh, those uh, very uh, challenges also in a multilateral way. So uh, uh, how much uh, patience uh, there uh, should be, uh, I will not be able to give you a ready-made answer right now, uh, but uh, what I can uh, say is that this is exactly the kind of issue where we should be sitting together with US and discussing and finding a common approach with uh, China. Uh, and uh, uh, if we'll be acting together, of course, it's going to be also more uh, powerful uh, signal. Uh, on uh, labor and sustainable development uh, commitments in a comprehensive agreement uh, on investment you mentioned, uh, there uh, uh, we can look at uh, experience already how uh, with our uh, free trade agreement with South Korea, because the language on international labor organization conventions uh, in comprehensive agreement on investment with China is the same language we have in a uh, free trade agreement with South Korea. And uh, given that uh, South Korea was uh, slow, so to say, in its work towards uh, uh, ratification and application, uh, application of uh, relevant uh, ILO uh, conventions, uh, we uh, triggered a dispute within our uh, sustainable development uh, chapter and recently a panel found that uh, the commitments uh, which are in our agreement with South Korea are actually binding and correspondingly uh, South Korea needs to implement them. So that's a panel uh, 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 finding which uh, was there in our uh, bilateral dispute uh, settlement. So I think it already indicates the nature of the bindingness of this uh, commitment and in any case in our comprehensive agreement of China it's uh, very uh, clear what is important is implementation so not only what we agree on paper but whether it's actually happening on ground so we have uh, I would say uh, classical state-to-state uh, -state dispute settlement system but we also have a fast track procedure and possibility to escalate uh, 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 dispute uh, quickly to political level in situation of uh, serious uh, breaches. So to uh, say uh, how uh, no, not to be mired somewhere, you know, in uh, administrative uh, procedures on administrative nitty gritty. 
And similarly, we have a mechanism to address differences concerning the uh, sustainable development chapter of our uh, deal. So we had been uh, thinking uh, quite a bit on uh, actually this implementation and enforcement part of our deal. Thank you. Um, we're nearing the end of our time. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, I think COVID-19 is on all of our minds. I know it's on mine. Um, I've been, the last time I, I left the United States was one year ago today. That's tough for me. Um, there was news this morning and news the last few days about the situation with the vaccine in the EU and Northern Ireland. Um, this is the export controls are, are always relevant. They're particularly relevant now, I think, um, including as a part of, of the COVID pandemic. Um, what, um, what can you say about the situation with Northern Ireland and, and potential export controls? Uh, well, uh, as regards uh, 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 rollout of the uh, vaccination uh, in the EU, uh, indeed, uh, as you are aware, there are uh, uh, problems uh, which we need to uh, be addressing because it's uh, clear that right now ensuring vaccination of the population is a top uh, priority. And for this, we need to make uh, sure that we have absolute clarity and transparency on vaccine production in the EU and its uh, uh, exports. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, transparency uh, was not forthcoming in actions of some of the uh, companies. Uh, correspondingly, uh, we had to introduce this uh, export uh, authorization uh, system, uh, uh, which uh, means that uh, uh, indeed uh, companies need to seek this uh, prior uh, authorization but they also need to provide us with all necessary information on vaccine production and uh, vaccine uh, exports. So uh, uh, what we had been uh, very clear in outlining that uh, this is not there to block uh, exports. So what we uh, want to achieve is uh, transparency and proportionality. Uh, so in a sense, uh, we can understand the situation. It's a rollout of new vaccines. Uh, it's unprecedented uh, situation. Volumes are huge. There may be problems. There may be uh, hiccups. So the only thing which we want to achieve here is that in situations like this, EU supplies are not affected disproportionately. So in a sense that EU, for whatever reasons, are is not being uh, left uh, out, uh, uh, but it's uh, clear that in this case, uh, supplies are uh, insured proportionately. And uh, I would say as long as uh, companies in, uh, are fulfilling their supply uh, commitments, uh, there should be absolutely no uh, problems on receiving this uh, export uh, authorization. Uh, as regards uh, specifically uh, Northern uh, Ireland, indeed there had been some uh, discussions, but uh, following the discussions with uh, Irish and UK authorities, uh, Northern Ireland is uh, exempt from uh, this uh, system. And actually there is a quite long list of exemptions. So we exempted uh, uh, from the system vaccines which are provided as humanitarian aid. Uh, we uh, exempted our uh, uh, countries which are in EU single uh, market outside the EU, so so-called EFTA countries. Uh, we exempted uh, neighborhood countries and we exempted uh, developing countries which are covered uh, by COVAX facility, which is the commitment to su uh, uh, support the vaccination, uh, not only in developed countries, but also in developing countries. So we had been very clear in exempting all those uh, countries uh, from the measure. And in any case, it's a temporary uh, measure aimed uh, to uh, work and until uh, end of March. Um, oops, here I am again. Thank you very much. Um, someday we'll get over the mute, unmute on, on the Zoom calls. It never seems to work that well. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it was a pleasure to speak with you, and I hope that our audience um, learned important things today. Um, I 
wish you well in your um, efforts to uh, cooperate with the Biden administration, particularly on, on international trade and working together uh, to make the trading system better and more effective. Thank you, Mr. Thank Executive you. President. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.